two years ago, Tanya Niederman, a mother in New Jersey, was at a restaurant when she answered her phone. A call that she got would change her life forever. A call that would tear any parent's heart out. Her only son, JJ, a typical American kid who loved to be outside, loved fishing, played hockey, had been found dead in his bedroom at home dead from a recreational drug laced with fentanyl, poisoned by a drug so potent it can kill someone with an amount equivalent to a few grains of salt. Across our nation, from big cities to small towns, fentanyl is driving a surge of deaths. Last year, the Center for Disease Control estimated that over 70,000 Americans died from fentanyl overdoses in 2021. It is the leading cause of death for American ages 18 to 49. So Secretary Robinson, Administrator Milgram, Director Gupta, thank you for appearing before us today to speak about one of the most urgent challenges facing the American public. The Foreign Relations Committee is holding this hearing because this is a crisis we cannot solve just within our borders. According to the Drug Enforcement Administration, most of the fentanyl trafficked into the United States is produced in clandestine labs in Mexico with precursor chemicals secured from China. We need to use every foreign policy tool we have to stop the flow of fentanyl into our country. This means asking Mexico to do more to disrupt criminal organizations from producing and trafficking fentanyl. Although a politicized judiciary and incidents of Mexican security forces colluding with drug cartels will make that very difficult, but we have to try. It means expanding our work with India to strengthen regulation of its chemical and pharmaceutical industries. And of course, it also means confronting China. I doubt Xi Jinping cares about his chemical and pharmaceutical industries supplying the Mexican cartels that are flooding the United States with fentanyl. But let's be clear, his government's negligence is helping unleash a deadly wave of fentanyl-related deaths. Not only here in the United States, but also in Canada, in Mexico, as well as countries in East and Southeast Asia that are struggling with their own crisis of synthetic opioids from China. While we have been trying to address this crisis for years, we all need to do more. That's why I co-authored the Fentanyl Sanctions Act with Senator Schumer in 2019, which established the Commission on Combating Synthetic Opioid Trafficking to chart a strategic approach for addressing this crisis. And last year, I co-sponsored and helped secure the enactment of Senator Shaheen's Fentanyl Results Act. And that's why I'm urging the Biden administration to take additional steps to confront the fentanyl epidemic, prioritizing counter-narcotic cooperation with willing partners, holding perpetrators and enablers of illicit fentanyl trafficking accountable. It's time for the United States to build a multilateral coalition to hold China accountable for failure to meet its international obligations to stop illicit drug trafficking. China needs to take practical and common sense steps to address this problem right now. Like implementing Know Your Customer Standards, which protect against fraud, corruption, and money laundering. But if Beijing fails to cooperate in good faith on indictments or on money laundering investigations, on information sharing on fentanyl and fentanyl precursor trafficking, the United States will have no choice but to take unilateral steps by expanding sanctions, visa restrictions, and other tools to protect the American people. And as the Commission on Combating Synthetic Opioid Trafficking detailed in its semi-annual report last year, we need to be just as proactive here at home. From strengthening high-tech screening at our borders to disrupting the open trafficking of fentanyl across our social media platforms, to taking additional steps to expand access to treatment and support services for those in our community struggling with substance use disorder. That's why I think it's time to revisit the 2018 Support Act, to confront the growing threat of fentanyl and the pressing need to expand access to mental health and substance use services. Uh, these are just some of the dimensions of this incredible challenge. Uh, and I look forward to working on all of those iterations. With that, let me turn to the ranking member, Senator Rich, for his opening statement. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I think we all know that illicit fentanyl and other synthetic opioids pose an unprecedented threat to American families. Far too many people in America know the heartache associated 
with the loss of life related to these deadly substances since almost all have had some contact with the uh, heartache that's uh, associated with that. In 2021, more than 100,000 Americans, more than 100,000 Americans died from drug overdoses, nearly 70% of which were from fentanyl poisoning. Fentanyl-related uh, deaths among children 14 and under have also tripled since 2019. Many of these deaths involve counterfeit prescription pills laced with fentanyl, which law enforcement agencies report are easily accessible uh, through social media. Addressing this threat will require greater awareness about the dangers of fentanyl, better coordination of local, state, and federal law enforcement resources for mental health, and effective, very effective, international cooperation. But where do these drugs even come from? Another way to stem this crisis is to identify and cut off the pipelines uh, where we can. China is the primary source of illicit fentanyl and synthetic opioid precursors uh, that the Mexican cartels are using to manufacture lethal, uh, lethal drugs. They're then smuggling these drugs into the United States. Chinese traffickers and money launderers are also increasing cooperation with Mexican cartels. Mexican cartels leverage their drug trafficking profits to acquire sophisticated weapons, corrupt officials, challenge the authority of the Mexican state, and commit terrible atrocities. The same cartels are profiting from and prolonging the illegal migration crisis caused by the Biden administration's weak enforcement of border security and immigration controls. Several of my Senate Foreign Relations uh, Committee colleagues and I released a report last year offering concrete recommendations to improve border security. Unfortunately, the administration refuses to even acknowledge we have a problem. It's time the administration wakes up. We have a serious threat at the border, and the president needs to be serious about addressing it. The Chinese government's tacit endorsement of this massive drug trade is a huge issue. Yet the readout of the president's meeting with Xi Jinping in November makes no mention whatsoever of this really serious problem. Worse, if China is complicit in supplying fentanyl that comes to the United States, then we need to consider an appropriate uh, sanctions regime. Chinese officials should also understand that drug producing or transit countries eventually become drug-using countries. China's complacency could have dire consequences for the future of its nation. I encourage President uh, uh, Obrador of Mexico to de deepen our bilateral security cooperation for the sake of our region's security and prosperity. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. And I commend uh, the men and women of your organization who were organizations who work every day uh, protecting our communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, as a matter of personal privilege, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to welcome our uh, Idaho Secretary of State. Uh, he's here meeting with the other Secretary of States who do a great job running our elections around America. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Risch, and welcome to the Secretary. We're happy to have you here with us uh, as well. Uh, let me uh, uh, introduce our panel. Assistant Secretary Todd Robinson leads international narcotics and law enforcement affairs at the Department of State. Secretary Robinson previously served as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Guatemala and our Charge de Affairs in Venezuela. We're looking forward to hearing from you today. We're also joined by the Administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Ann Milgram. Administrator Milgram previously served as New Jersey's Attorney General and a federal prosecutor in the United States Department of Justice, where she was the Special Litigation Counsel for the Prosecution of Human Trafficking Crimes. We appreciate your appearance. <laughs> and finally, we are joined by Dr. Raul Gupta, Director for the Office of National Drug Control Pro Policy. Previously, Dr. Gupta served as Health Commissioner in the State of West Virginia and as the Chief Medical and Health Officer and Senior Vice President at the March of Dimes. So we welcome you all. Your full statements will be included in the record without objection. Uh, I'd ask you to try to summarize your statements in about five minutes or so, so that we can have a robust uh, discussion. Dr. Gupta, I understand you're going to go first, and followed by Administrator Milgren, and then Secretary Robinson. Dr. Gupta. Good morning. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rich, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify here today. I'm honored to be joined by my colleagues who are vital partners in implementing President Biden's national drug control strategy and keeping our communities safe. This healing could not have come at a more important time. America is facing the worst drug crisis we've ever seen, with 46 million Americans suffering from a substance use disorder and more than 107,000 
Americans dying from drug overdose or accidental poisonings a year. These are not just members, but represent numbers, but represent devastating losses to families and communities with an American dying every five minutes of every hour of every day. This is an unacceptable to me, and it is unacceptable to the president. This crisis does more than cause tragic and preventable deaths. It is tearing the very fabric of our nation. It presents a direct and surging threat to public health, as well as our national security and economic prosperity. As a practicing physician, I've had a front row seat to the evolution of this epidemic. As you've seen in your own states, it cuts across every geographic, demographic, and economic boundary. The majority of illicit drugs harming Americans are produced outside of the United States. Criminal elements, mostly in the People's Republic of China, ship precursor chemicals to Mexico where they're used to produce illicit fentanyl. Illicit fentanyl has infiltrated the entire drug supply, including cocaine and meth. Finally, somewhere in America today, a teenager will find illicit drugs simply by opening a social media app on their phone. This is an era of new drug trafficking, a new era of drug trafficking, and it requires new era of drug policy. President Biden's strategy is tackling this novel threat head on. We're addressing two key drivers of the epidemic, untreated addiction and the drug trafficking profits that fuel it. Let me be perfectly clear. Addiction is a disease and that must be treated, and drug trafficking is a crime that must be prosecuted. If it remains easier to get illicit drugs in America than it is to treatment, we will never end this crisis. And that's why in his State of the Union address, President Biden launched a major surge to stop illicit fentanyl production, trafficking, and distribution at every choke point, including holding accountable the big tech companies that allow the sale of illegal drugs on their platforms. He also called for increasing the number of first responders and other professionals who can respond to mental health and substance use challenges. Thanks to the hard work of our law enforcement officers, we're seizing record amounts of illicit fentanyl and other drugs, and domestic seizures alone denied drug traffickers nearly $9 billion in profits last year. I want to emphasize that while seizures and arrests are critically important, this problem does not begin or end at the United States border. That's why we're working closely with our international partners, especially Mexico, Colombia, India, Canada, and others. The bilateral relationship between the United States and the PRC is complex and characterized by competition, yet there are areas in which we can cooperate and counter narcotics as one. We're urging the PRC to join us in this action, but rather than demonstrate global leadership by engaging in efforts to rein in illicit precursor production and trafficking, an issue where PRC plays an outsized role, the PRC is instead choosing to not engage. Now, I want to be clear. A nation that seeks to demonstrate global leadership must act as a global leader on global issues. Where security, prosperity, and lives around the world are at stake, there is no excuse for inaction. And the United States will continue to lead in the global coalition against illicit fentanyl with or without the PRC. At last month's North America Leaders Summit in Mexico City, for instance, President Biden made illicit fentanyl a main topic of conversation. He pressed President Lopez Obrador to act with a shared sense of responsibility towards the threat of drug trafficking and its associated criminality. And all of us here will work with Mexico to drive results. And at home, President Biden has led public health efforts to tackle this epidemic as well. We're expanding access to naloxone and treatment, focusing on evidence-based prevention and supporting people in recovery. Critically, we've worked closely with Republicans and Democrats in Congress to remove barriers to treatment for millions of Americans. We'll save lives as we implement this historic legislation in partnership with DEA and HHS. We're showing the country we can what we can accomplish when we work together. As the CDC just announced, we have now seen six straight months of reports where overdose numbers have decreased or been flat. That's around 3,000 people who haven't died and instead are at the dinner table each night. The opioid crisis is not a red state problem or a blue state problem. This is America's problem. And the President knows, just all of, as all of you know, that it will take all of us working together to solve it, all of us. This is the time to put politics aside and make life better for American people. To this end, my request to you and to Congress at large is to fully fund President Biden's drug control budget, which will be released soon. And I look forward to working with Congress to accomplish our shared goals to save American lives and keep our communities healthy and safe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Administrator Milgram.
Thank you, Senator. Thank you for the privilege of testifying before the committee today. Every single day when I walk into DEA headquarters in Arlington, Virginia, I walk past the faces of fentanyl memorial wall that we have built. Starting last summer, we asked families across the United States if they wanted to share with us a photo of one of the loved ones that they had lost to fentanyl poisoning. We started with about 100 photos in the first week last May. Today, there are 4,895 photos that line our headquarters walls at DEA in Arlington. The wall is a memorial to the lives that have been lost, and it is a call to action for the men and women of DEA that at this moment in time, we have to do everything we can to save American lives. The youngest person on that wall is Serenity Faith, forever 17 months old. And the oldest is James Cox, forever 70 years old. Those are just some of the lives lost. And we know that between August of 2021 and August of 2022, 107,735 American lives were lost to drug poisoning. Perhaps the most important thing that I can tell this committee today is that we know who is responsible. The Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco or CJ&G cartel, both cartels in Mexico, are responsible for the vast majority of fentanyl that is coming into the United States. It is why DEA has made the, defeating those two cartels our top operational priority. To explain a little more, those two cartels dominate the entire global fentanyl supply chain. They start in China where they are purchasing precursor chemicals to make fentanyl. They then take those chemicals into Mexico where they are mass producing fentanyl. First, fentanyl powder. And second, they are pressing a great deal of that powder into fake prescription pills in Mexico. Those pills look identical to real American and international medicines. Things like oxycodone, Percocet, Adderall, or Xanax. But they have no real medicine in them. They are fentanyl and filler. The cartels then move the fentanyl powder and the fake pills into the United States. They sell a lot of it on social media and in other ways across our country. We are now seizing fentanyl in all 50 states, and it is the deadliest drug threat our country has ever faced. After the cartels sell those drugs in the US, they work to get their profits back to Mexico. And they do that through illicit finance, Often today, we see through Chinese money laundering organizations that are operating both in the United States and in Mexico. For all these reasons, our top operational priority right now is to defeat these two cartels. First, we've taken a network-based approach to the cartels. We can no longer just target the high-value targets, the people at the top of the cartels, and expect that we will see a change. So we're targeting the entire networks from the precursor chemical companies in China to the chemists and the members of the cartel mass producing fentanyl in Mexico to the people transporting the fentanyl into the United States, selling the fentanyl in the United States, and then moving the money back into Mexico. Second, we formed this past September two counter threat teams. Right now, on top of all of DEA, our 332 offices worldwide in 69 countries, we have one counter threat team devoted solely to defeating the Sinaloa cartel and one devoted to the Jalisco cartel. On those teams, we have special agents, we have intelligence analysts, we have targeters, we have data scientists, and we have subject matter experts like chemists and experts on illicit finance and Chinese precursors. Those teams are mapping these entire cartels worldwide. We have now to date identified those two cartels in more than 40 countries around the world. In addition to mapping those cartels, they're analyzing those cartels to identify the key notes that we can use to defeat the cartels, and they're also targeting the cartels. We've already begun sending out target packages across the United States. In addition to all of that work, we're working in our communities. We know drug-related violence has increased, and we have seen the devastation of drug poisoning deaths. And finally, we're working on public awareness. 
and I know so, mem so many members of this committee are doing the same, but we believe that every American has to understand that one pill can kill and that fentanyl is the deadliest threat facing our country today. I want to close by saying that as you hear me talk today, you'll hear anger, frustration, and sadness in my voice. And I admit that I feel all of those things. But what drives me is not that. What drives me is the belief, the knowledge, that working together, we can defeat these two cartels, we can make our communities safe and healthy, and we can save American lives. Thank you for the privilege of being with you today. Thank you, Madam Administrator. Secretary Robinson. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Reich, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Synthetic drugs, including fentanyl, are a shared global challenge requiring a global approach. This is a top priority for President Biden and the administration, as he stated during last week's State of the Union address. I share the President's commitment to stop fentanyl production, sale, and trafficking. Secretary of State Blinken also has made clear we must bring the full power of American diplomacy to this challenge. We are engaging our foreign partners to protect national security and global health by, by disrupting the illicit synthetic drug supply chain and supporting the effective prevention, treatment, and recovery to end this epidemic and save American lives. Synthetic drugs can be produced virtually anywhere, often using legal chemicals and equipment. Traffickers adapt quickly to evade regulatory controls, and we must stay ahead of the curve with a more agile and comprehensive approach. We will treat this as both a security and public health threat. We will bring new partners on board, including countries that may soon be affected, as well as the private sector. And we will approach countries and other partners through the lens of joint responsibility for action. Most fentanyl seized in the United States is synthesized in Mexico using precursor chemicals sourced primarily from the PRC and then trafficked via the U.S. southern border. Our enduring security cooperation with Mexico is critical to our efforts to address fentanyl trafficking. The U.S.-Mexico Bicentennial Framework and the North American Drug Dialogue guide our work to disrupt the synthetic drug supply chain and promote public health. Both countries seized historic amounts of fentanyl in 2022. INL donated canines in Mexico helped seize more than 75,000 fentanyl pills from January to August 2022. Meanwhile, Mexico created a watch list to flag chemicals that can be diverted to illicit drug production and expanded this list from 14 to 69 chemicals. We hope Mexico will invest more in combating the synthetic drug threat from prevention, treatment, and recovery to the investigations and prosecutions. The United States remains committed to meaningful counter-narcotics cooperation with the PRC, despite the PRC's limited willingness to engage on the, issue, on the issue of late. Past cooperation has proven to be fruitful and effective. The PRC decision to schedule fentanyl-related substances as a class in 2019 essentially ended PRC origin shipments to the United States. Transnational criminal organizations adapted and now use PRC-sourced precursor chemicals to synthesize the, the fentanyl in Mexico. The PRC can and must do more as a global partner to limit criminal access to these chemicals. We continue to press them to take meaningful, concrete actions to curb criminal diversion of precursor chemicals, improve information sharing on global chemical flows, strengthen enforcement of customs manifesting, manifesting agreements, and uh, implement Know Your Customer standards to restrict sales of precursor chemicals. Foreign partners look to the United States for leadership on this issue. The 2022 UN Commission on Narcotics Drugs, at US urging, unanimously decided to internationally control three emerging fentanyl precursor chemicals. At the same UN meeting, the United States also secured agreement to redouble action on diversion and trafficking in unscheduled and designer precursors. We support global tools that facilitate international law enforcement uh, cooperation, establish best practices for denying criminals access to the tools, 
of modern commerce and strengthen norms to prevent the sale of precursor chemicals and tableting equipment. Private industry must also play a role since many precursor chemicals used in illicit drug production have legitimate uses. We will partner with a variety of industries to disrupt synthetic drug supply chains. Finally, Congress can play a role, a vital role, in supporting our efforts. Uh, we need Congress to look at permanently uh, uh, controlling fentanyl-related substances as a class. Synthetic drugs are an urgent priority for us, and we are committed to working with all partners, including Congress, to develop solutions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you all, and um, we'll start our, a round of questions. Uh, Administrator Milgren, is it uh, fair to say that the vast majority of fentanyl trafficking comes into our nation through official ports of entry? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, as you know, the Department of Homeland Security is responsible for the American border and the ports of entry, so DEA is not engaged at the border or the ports of entry. What I can tell you from our cases and the work that we do across the United States and across the world is that virtually all the fentanyl that we are seizing in the United States is coming from Mexico, and we do believe that much of that is coming through ports of entry in California and Arizona. But again, I would defer conversation or questions specifically about the port to DHS. Okay, and to the extent that uh, you know, are they coming through the hands of vulnerable people seeking uh, to fleeing their country? I would have to defer that question, Senator, to the Department of Homeland Security. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me uh, ask a question maybe you can answer. Uh, and that is, uh, in Mexico, dealing with this problem without a partner in Mexico is not possible. Um, the two cartels that you mentioned emanate from Mexico. Uh, it's impossible to tackle fentanyl trafficking without a productive partnership with Mexico. However, there are obstacles to improving cooperation. Mexico's increased politicized national Prosecutor's Office has shown little appetite to prosecute fentanyl-related cases. Collusion between cartels and Mexico authorities is a recurring challenge as seen in the ongoing trial of former Security Minister Garcia Luna. And Mexican authorities seem unwilling to acknowledge that the vast majority of fentanyl entering the United States is manufactured in clandestine labs in Mexico. Uh, so what is it that we are doing with the Lopez Obrador government uh, to change that reality. As you go after these cartels, uh, do you, uh, is it your assessment that, that uh, uh, the primary obstacles to improving cooperation with Mexican authorities to combat fentanyl trafficking is that uh, either we don't have a willing partner or uh, that, in fact, the state itself uh, is infiltrated uh, by the cartels? Senator, thank you for that question. We believe Mexico needs to do more to stop the harm that we're seeing. As I stated, what we're seeing is that these two cartels in Mexico, the Sinaloa and the Jalisco cartel, are dominating and controlling the entire global supply chain of fentanyl. And they are operating throughout Mexico. The Sinaloa cartel, we believe, is operating in 19 of 32 Mexican states, and the Jalisco cartel is operating in 23 of 32 Mexican states. What we know is that Mexico in the past worked relentlessly from 2012 to 2015 to disrupt one of the most violent criminal networks in Mexico, the Zetas, and they were effective at dismantling that cartel. We want Mexico to do the same thing here, to make their top operational priority also to defeat the two cartels that we believe are responsible for the fentanyl as well as the methamphetamine that is responsible for the loss of American lives today. But that's not the present state of Mexico's will. Secretary Robinson. Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, I, um, I would say that uh, we, in the conversations we've had, uh, Mexico is willing to do more. Uh, 
they have actively engaged with us both through the uh, the U.S. Uh, bicentennial, uh, U.S.-Mexico bicentennial framework, where they have committed uh, to doing more. They've also committed to doing more uh, in the discussions we've had in the North American drug dialogue. Um, what we've been asking Mexico to do is uh, uh, put more resources into this effort, uh, which is, you know, uh, obviously, a, a, for for Mexico and the Mexican government, uh, a domestic issue. For us, it's an international issue. For us, it's a national security issue. Um, the the amount of resources they put into uh, this effort is for them a domestic issue, and and it's something that we're we're trying to deal with. I have to be honest with you. I I don't see it. I just don't see it. I don't see the willingness, I don't see the urgency, I don't see the commitment, I don't see the actions that would indicate to me that Mexico is being a good partner. Have you talked to our ambassador there about this? Is he engaged on this issue? Yes, yes and yes to, to both questions. Well, I, I, I hope he's vigorously engaged on the issue because, uh, you know, we start with China and precursor criminals and we need to create an international coalition that pressures China. They, they, they promote themselves as a big counter-narcotics uh, nation, quite on the contrary, just from my perspective. And then we have our next door neighbor who, this is a critical issue, and I just don't see it happening. And I have to be honest with you, if, if the good overtures to try to get them to act is not working, then there has to be other considerations. I just think that we, are, we, we work with our Mexican friends with kid gloves on this issue. And I just is fundamentally wrong. I don't know how many more lives have to be lost uh, for Mexico to get engaged. If, 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 if this was in the reverse, uh, they'd be all over us. President Lopez Obrador would be all over us in this regard. Lastly, uh, can you work, uh, Administrator? You, can your people work freely uh, with Mexican counterparts? Are you concerned about... Uh, the information, the intelligence, the, uh, the security of what you're trying to do with your counterparts in Mexico? Senator, thank you. Thank you for the question. And there are three ways in which we believe that we would like to see Mexico cooperate far more with DEA and with the United States. The first, and this is under the Bicentennial Framework, the first is information sharing. We are not getting information on fentanyl seizures. We are not getting information on seizures of precursor chemicals. And that kind of information, as you rightly state, is vital for both countries, both for Mexico and for the United States. Second, we are very concerned about the clandestine labs across Mexico, and we have offered um, and continue to offer and stand ready to work in partnership with Mexican authorities to dismantle and take down those clandestine labs throughout Mexico jointly and to be of any service that we can. And finally, the, the last point you just mentioned, the Garcia Luna trial, which is a DEA investigation. The trial is ongoing in the Eastern District of New York this week. One of the things we are looking for Mexico to do is to arrest and extradite more individuals to the United States. Last year, Mexico extradited 24 drug-related defendants to the United States, but there are 232 drug-related defendants that are awaiting extradition. So this is also a critical part of our work. And again, we're working globally it, across the world as we're now tracking these cartels in 40 different countries, but it is vital that we be able to work in Mexico as well. Senator Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Am Ambassador uh, Robinson, I, I have the president's, uh, the president's uh, readout from his conversation with uh, Xi Jinping on uh, November 14th. And I'm sure you've probably seen this and, uh, and, and been through it. And what struck me uh, is that uh, there is not one mention in here of the fentanyl problem that we've got with China. Uh, do you know whether or not the president raised this with uh, Xi Jinping when he had this conversation? Thank you, Senator. I, I don't know if they um, uh, were able to get to it, to it during their conversation. Uh, I do know that, uh, as you know, 
Uh, the relationship between the United States and, and China is complex. There are a lot of issues uh, on the table. Um, uh, but there is no doubt that this administration and the Secretary are both keenly aware of the importance of this issue and have charged us at the State Department with, uh, with reaching out to our international partners to, to work as closely as possible on this. Um, I, I, I think complex is as kind of way as you could say it regarding our relationship with China at the present time. But uh, 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 we understand from uh, other people that state that uh, that you guys are getting the Heisman from them. They're just stiff arming you and saying, "Well, you guys should quit using drugs," and that's the end of it. Is that your experience with uh, what you're getting from the Chinese? Uh, we have had very limited uh, engagement uh, with China. Uh, on this issue in particular. I know our ambassador, uh, Ambassador Burns in Beijing, has had some uh, conversations uh, at the ministerial level, but there is a lot more uh, that, we could, that we could do together. And we know good things happen when China uh, uh, takes responsibility for, this, for, these, for this issues like this. We saw it in 2019 when they scheduled fentanyl uh, and, and the chemicals. It, it stopped almost completely uh, coming directly from China to the United States. Right. I think most people are aware of that. The difficulty, of course, is, is that uh, uh, that situation deteriorated dramatically and quickly. And we're back to where we were before, and uh, nothing's. China is not impressing us as doing anything on this issue anymore. Is that is that your impression? My impression is that they could do that. That there are basic steps they could take that they're not taking uh, right now that could help a lot. Uh, they could. Uh, monitor and make more transparent the labeling of chemicals leaving the country. Um, uh, they could exchange more information uh, with us. Uh, and they could follow, follow the trail and make sure that the companies that are uh, exporting these chemicals know who the chemicals are going to, uh, particularly in Mexico, where we know the, the drug is being synthesized. They're not doing that now. Uh, they're not talking to us really about it, um, but they, sh they should. And, and if they did, we think that this would go a long way towards uh, 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 helping to, to get at the issue. Yeah, well, that, that's an accurate description of what I've heard also. And I, I don't know what the path forward is. I guess that's you guys' job. But uh, you, you need to come up with something to, uh, to get their attention. And uh, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, it certainly isn't working right now. Uh, Administrator Milgram, first of all, let me say I want to associate myself with the remarks of the chairman regarding uh, uh, our impression of what Mexico is not doing uh, and causing us no, no end problem. And uh, so uh, your, your appearing here today and your very clear-eyed description of what's happening and not happening uh, and putting the uh, blame right where it belongs is greatly appreciated, and I think it'll help underscore for the American people what needs to be done. And I think the chairman has uh, uh, laid out uh, very clearly that uh, that there does need to be something done differently, or there's going to have to be other other action taken. Um, one of the things that bothers me, and I I always uh, I hate to put it in in these terms, but the. the I, I cringe every time I hear somebody from the administration say, oh, well, the border's secure. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, America does not believe that, that the border is secure with the thousands of people that are coming across. Um, I, are you, do you agree that this, this catastrophe we have on the border is contributing to the uh, problem of the uh, uh, drugs coming into the country? Senator, thank you so much for that question. Um, the DEA does not operate the border or the ports of entry. I get that. That's not your fault. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we don't operate the border or the ports of entry, so I would defer questions to them. What I can tell you is that at DEA, we view our job as playing offense, as targeting the cartels worldwide to do everything we can to stop the fentanyl and the methamphetamine and other deadly drugs from even getting to that point. And we also, once the drugs have entered the United States, we work relentlessly to make sure our communities are safe and healthy by stopping drug-related violence and drug poisonings. We view DHS's role as, as they have the primary mission of playing defense, 
of stopping fentanyl from entering at the border. And so we know that that's a vital part of this conversation. Last year, we seized, at year's end, the final calculation was 57 million fake fentanyl pills and more than 13,000 pounds of fentanyl. That's the equivalent of 410 million potential deadly doses that we seized in the United States of America. Well, I appreciate that, and I, I appreciate that that isn't your primary obligation, but uh, I, I think you should keep pressure on those that we know who, uh, th that their primary obligation is to secure the border. I think that would be very helpful. My time's up, but let me ask one quick question about uh, uh, the social media aspects of this. Are you having any luck at all with the social media platforms? Uh, I understand that's secondary. You want to stop it from coming in first, but once it gets here, it, obviously, the as you've indicated, social media platforms are a real scourge for uh, distributing this stuff. Are you having any, any luck there at all? Senator, thank you for the question, and I think it's a critical uh, point for us to discuss today. We view social media right now as the super highway of drugs. And if I could just take a moment, and it will seem like I'm going a little bit off social media, but I promise I'm coming right back. The question I get asked when I am out in the public more than any other is why would these cartels kill their customers? And the answer today is that fen fentanyl is so addictive that the cartels are using it to drive addiction. And for them, if a user dies, it is the cost of doing business. We are in a very different position than we were 20 years ago before social media existed, where someone who might be selling narcotics had more of a personal relationship with the person who was buying. Today, the cartels understand that if someone dies from taking their deadly fentanyl, that there are 100 million other users on Snapchat that they can sell their drugs to. There are more than 150 million American users on Facebook and on Instagram that they can sell their drugs to. And so social media is truly the super highway of drugs. And I welcome a visit from any of the members of this committee to DEA headquarters, and I can show you the faces of the American lives lost from fake pills purchased on Snapchat, from fake pills purchased on Facebook, from fake pills purchased on Instagram and TikTok and other sites. So the short answer, sorry, the long answer coming to, to the short closing is that the social media sites are not doing nearly enough. And we would welcome the opportunity to work with this committee and others in Congress to make sure that the social media companies are held accountable and that they become fully transparent about what is happening and what they're doing. Right. Are you, do you, did I understand you right that, uh, that half of the American people, 150 million people, or a third, 100 million, are are using our, our fentanyl customers? No, Senator, I'm sorry. They're, they're customers of social media. I What's see. happened in, in the decades since uh, the internet and globalization is that there are a vast number of Americans who are on social media, and those transactions where the cartels and their traffickers are marketing and selling these fake prescription pills and other drugs all over social media, we see that on a daily basis. And what we see is that the, the cartels will just pivot to the next potential buyer on those, on those social media platforms. And there are many Americans Senator on those Murphy. social media platforms. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just uh, add to the bipartisan consensus on this panel. Um, I understand that our witnesses have to be diplomatic in the way that they talk about Mexico. But um, let's be honest, at best, Mexico is not taking this crisis seriously enough, and at worst, the Mexican government, or at least significant parts of it, uh, are either looking the other way or complicit with the cartels. That's just the truth. Um, to answer Senator Menendez's question from before, it is actually true that the vast majority of fentanyl that's coming into the United States at the southern border is coming through the ports. Um, as the chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds uh, our border operations. That's why we are putting increased amounts of resources to catch it there. And I don't necessarily know that the DAA should defer to DHS on that question. It's obviously your job to know where and how the drugs are coming across the border. Um, but it is also true that the ports in Mexico um, are a big problem as well. And I just don't think it's realistic that we're gonna defeat the Mexican drug cartels in the next five years. Maybe you think differently. Um, but concentrating efforts on those ports, on the Mexican ports, which are often controlled 
by those cartels, um, I, I think is a interesting place to start. And so, um, Administrator Milligan, I wanted to ask you that question. Um, what is our level of integration with Mexican authorities to unwind the corruption that exists at the ports? And is that a logical place for us to try to target our resources, given that that's where most of the precursor is showing up and being transferred to the cartels? Senator, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, if, I, if I could, let me start by talking a little bit about corruption generally. What we see is that corruption is a part of narcotics trafficking worldwide. And there are many examples that we could give. DEA uh, was the lead investigative agency on the current case we just spoke about, the Garcia Luna case. We also did the investigation that led to the charges against the, the current Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro. And Talk others. about the ports just because I'm going to run out of time. Yep. So it, it, let me say two things. The first is that you are correct in saying that the vast majority of precursor chemicals for methamphetamine are coming in at the Mexican ports. I would see it differently on the fentanyl precursors. We see many of those also coming into the airports. Yep. So what I is- I guess I mean land and sea ports. Yeah, what, what's happening, and I, I would just sort of describe this a little bit, is that the precursor chemicals necessary for methamphetamine are enormously big. The precursor chemicals necessary for fentanyl are much smaller. And again, we know that tiny amounts, the amount that fits on the tip of a pencil, are potentially deadly for fentanyl. And the precursors needed to make that amount are far smaller. So are we focused on the ports and the airports and also overland conveyances through Latin America? Yes, Senator, we are. Um, Can I jump in, please? Let me, um, let me just turn to um, an, another topic because I want to get uh, at least one more in. Um, in a meeting I had with the now Chinese foreign minister, and I'll ask this to you, Secretary Robinson, but uh, hopefully you're the right person to answer this. Um, they made a claim that our coordination um, has um, been limited by a set of sanctions that the Commerce Department applied in 2020 against China's Institute for Forensic Science. Um, at the Ministry of Public Security and their National Narcotics Laboratory. Now, these were sanctions connected to human rights violations authorized by Congress. Um, is there any validity that these sanctions have impacted our ability to work with the Chinese government? The claim is that if we were to lift those particular sanctions, that we would open up new avenues of cooperation on this question of precursor export into Mexico. Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. The short answer is no. Um, the facility that they're talking about is a large facility. One part of that facility was sanctioned uh, by, by the Commerce Department, um, but the larger, the narcotics bureau or, or laboratory was not. Um, the, the PRC has been using this as an excuse not to uh, engage with us on this issue. Um, and, and then maybe I'll submit this question of the rec for the record, but um, I, I also think it's important to understand the, the circular trade that happens at the Mexican border with these cartels. It's American guns going south, and it's Chinese and Mexican drugs coming north. Um, I'd congratulate this Congress. And, and money. And money. And money, right, going both ways. Um, I'd congratulate this Congress because in the last budget for the first time, we put $50 million specifically towards the work of interrupting the gun trade, the firearms trade going south. Uh, and I would encourage us to understand the, the, the sort of full circle of this trade, that much of this is what's coming to us, but we are fueling um, the cartel's ability to run this trade by allowing these guns to be bought in the United States through background checks, exceptions, and sent down to Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, member, Senator Ricketts, who we welcome to the committee. is a new member. Senator Ricketts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Taryn Lee Griffith was a 24-year-old mom from Nebraska who died in 2021 of a fentanyl overdose. Her father, Mike, said that once you met Taryn, you'd never forget her. She had a personality that drew people's attention the moment she walked into the room and a big heart for others. Uh, the day that Taryn died, she was out with friends and took a pill that he shot, thought was Percocet that was laced with fentanyl. And that's what killed her. Uh, Taryn's youngest daughter was just six months old when her mother died, and she has a five-year-old half-sister, and they'll have to get to know Taryn through pictures and stories from family. 
Fentanyl, as I think we all agree, robs children of their parents and parents of their children. They rob communities of our friends, coworkers, and neighbors. From 2014 to 2019, most fentanyl entered the U.S. by the international mail directly from China. Now it's being shipped from China to Mexico, manufactured into pills at illegal labs, and then smuggled across the border. The Mexican cartels have taken advantage of the weak border enforcement to surge a flow of fentanyl within the U to the U.S., with border agents and local law enforcement overwhelmed by the surge of illegal immigration, it's easier than ever to get for cartels to bring fentanyl into the U.S. Last year, last fiscal year, the CBP seized 14,700 pounds of fentanyl. And I can tell you, as my experience as a governor, in the last two years of my administration, we saw the amounts of fentanyl, methamphetamine, and cocaine double, triple, quintuple um, as our state patrol confiscated as it came through our state. Until the Biden administration takes action to secure our southern border to stop the flow of illegal immigration and drugs, I'm afraid that this is going to be a, a bigger problem in the future. So my, my question is for Dr. Gupta. Uh, CBP reported 156,274 enforcement encounters on the border only last month. With this large amount of unregulated activity and movement of people, is it even possible to stop the flow of fentanyl across the border? Do we need to stop the flow of illegal immigration first? I mean, it seems like either there's more drugs across, coming across the border or the Biden administration is not stopping those drugs across, coming across the border. Uh, what's, the, what's the Biden administration's plan for this? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, you know, the fact is all the elements we have, we know that most of the drugs that are coming through are through ports of entry. And it is through commercial traffic, it's through private traffic, and it's through individuals. Um, we still do not scan enough of that traffic. And that's where the President's talked about having, making sure that we have scanners, that we do have technology to place and scan every vehicle that needs scanning. We're not there yet, we want to be there. And that's the whole point. So when we see increased fentanyl, it's because we're applying technology. And I want to see every port have that technology and be able to scan every vehicle that we can uh, coming in. But the problem, again, does not begin or end at the border. So we've got to be working at ports in Mexico, which we are with the Coast Guard training um, CIMAR, the Mexican Navy, to make sure that they're doing their job because they're the ones who are the control of the ports there to stop those shipments of uh, precursors, but also the prepared product as well. Now, when I was down at the southern border I, a couple of times as governor, one of the things in talking to the folks down there, they said is that the cartels will push across a group of illegal immigrants in one location, thus drawing our resources off, and then push the fentanyl in a different location. Is that, so you're saying it was coming through the ports, but, I, but when, I heard, when I was on the border, that's not what I was hearing when I was down there. So we've got to understand one basic pretext here. Uh, these are dispassionate businessmen working men and women, working after, going after profit. So what they deploy these technologies and these uh, tactics to do all of these things. And every time we seize, we deny them the profits. The thing is, these are calculated losses. Instead of going through the unforgiving terrain, they want their retail product to get in the market and make money for them as quickly as possible, and that's where ports of entry make sense. Now, what we have to do is deny them just enough so it is no longer profitable and it no longer supports their operating capital. And that's the strategy that it's important to understand that working where they're dependent upon their product to get through is exactly what needs to obstruct and disrupt that. We've talked about the CCP and some of the supply chain there. What's the Biden administration's thought on how we uh, stop the CCP from not only violating our airspace with spy balloons, but also on this, the precursors in this very deadly drug? Senator, I've been several times to the border and will be going again. I've seen the tunnels, the subterranean tunnels, as well as marine drones and other aspects. And therefore, it becomes important that we provide those resources to our brave women and men at Custom Border Protection for both technology, infrastructure, as well as resources to be able to go after. And that's exactly what the President will be asking for um, in, in his budget release soon. But this is why having those 123 additional scanners, the large scanners, is going to be so important at our ports of entry as well. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Cardin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me assure my colleague from Nebraska, whether it's Nebraska or Maryland or any state in this country, the fentanyl crisis is a crisis, and we're losing citizens every day uh, to fentanyl. 
And the tragedy here is that there are a lot of innocent users that are dying from the fentanyl, not expecting it to be laced uh, uh, with fentanyl. So uh, this is an urgent issue in our nation. And Chairman, thank you for, for holding an early hearing on this subject because it's not an easy issue. We always talk about supply and demand. Well, the demand side is a little bit challenging here because, as the Senator from Nebraska pointed out, people do not expect that they're going to be uh, dealing with a fentanyl-laced uh, uh, product. Uh, so we'll always deal with demand, but let's talk supply. And supply is complicated because we have the cartels and the distribution networks, and then we have the supply of the precursors, which are taking over from the fentanyl itself, being manufactured uh, through the precursors. So, Mrs. Mulgan, you mentioned the cartels, and you're, you have a task force to, to deal with that. What do you need from us in order for us to be able to make a real impact on the viability of these cartels. They operate in trafficking of drugs and so many other activities, anything they can make money off of. But without the cartels, the network would certainly be much less uh, dangerous to our country. Thank you, Senator. Um, let me start by actually thanking Congress. We were very pleased and we feel fortunate to have gotten additional funding from Congress in the last budget. $40 million that allows us to expand our counter threat teams that were operating worldwide to target these two cartels. It also allows us to build vital infrastructure around data and technology to integrate all the information we have at DEA. And so first, let me say thank you for that. Second, as you point out, um, a couple of things. The first is that right now we have pivoted to a world of synthetic drugs where the fentanyl we're talking about and the methamphetamine we're talking about that is made by these two cartels, Sinaloa and Jalisco, it is entirely man-made. And right now there is no limit on how much of those drugs can be made. The only limit are the amount of precursor chemicals that the cartels can get access to. So first of all, working to have China do more to stop these- I want to get to the precursors. Uh, and. The challenge here, you may want to elaborate, and others might uh, want to also, uh, particularly Ambassador Robinson on this, but these are the precursors uh, are now coming in from various countries. I understand India is becoming a major source also of precursor drugs. They have lawful purposes, but they have illegal purposes, and they mean put together for fentanyl. So how do we get a handle on the precursors when it, it seems like the illegal uh, uh, traffickers are one step ahead of us. Uh, as we clamp down on fentanyl coming in, they moved to the precursors and manufactured the fentanyl. Senator, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this, uh, for the question. Um, and you hit on uh, an important uh, uh, topic. Uh, we are, we, the United States government, the, the administration, are working uh, aggressively, engaging with our European partners. Uh, we are uh, working quite closely with India. Um, we don't see, in fact, uh, uh, precursors uh, largely coming, coming from India uh, to Mexico to to um, uh, to make uh, fentanyl. Um, almost, it, it's almost exclusively distributors from from China. Uh, and in fact, the Indians have been uh, the Indian government has been uh, positive on this issue. They're working with us uh, in the G20. Uh, we are in discussions about setting up a uh, a counter narcotics working group during their presidency of the of the G20. So we we are. Um, uh, engaged with the international community, both on a multilateral level, uh, with the UN uh, in Vienna at the, the CND, but also on a bilateral level uh, with, uh, with countries like India uh, and uh, individual European countries. The last thing I would say, though, is for the United States, fentanyl is the problem. For Europe, uh, it's uh, uh, methamphetamines. For uh, Africa, it's tramadol. Um, the the issue the issue of synthetic opioids opioids in general um, uh, is a global issue and has a lot of different layers. Uh, they are all engaged at some level, both bilaterally and internationally, in uh, engaging and addressing on, addressing it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm looking at the leaders of the effort 
that's supposed to be stopping drugs in America. I just got off the phone the other day with a father from my home state of Tennessee who found his son dead on Thanksgiving morning, dead from fentanyl. Each of the three of you have been charged with addressing this scourge, yet it continues to run rampant. The number one killer of Americans today, of young people between the ages of 18 and 45, is drug overdose, most of it fentanyl, coming across our southern border, being supplied by China, just as Secretary Robinson mentioned. China's the principal source of these drug precursors that are going to the Mexican cartels. Dr. Gupta, you've mentioned this. Uh, in August, you stated that fentanyl will continue to flood the world unless China stops drug trafficking. Indeed, I want to use your quote. China's decision to refuse cooperation in this issue will result in more American deaths. So, Dr. Gupta, has China done enough to stop the transport of fentanyl precursors from China to Mexico? I'd appreciate a yes or no answer. No, Senator. I agree. Is pressing the Chinese Communist Party to stop fentanyl precursors coming from China a top administration priority? Again, I'd appreciate a yes or no answer. Senator, it is. I'm glad to hear that. Dr. Gupta, the White House issued a press release last week on its proposals for cracking down on fentanyl trafficking. Yet, not once, not once in the entire press release was China mentioned. Moreover, during the State of the Union, not once did the President call out China's role in this fentanyl crisis. If getting China to stop fentanyl production that's killing hundreds of Americans daily is a top priority, then why didn't President Biden mention it at the State of the Union? Senator, if I can elaborate, this is one of the top priority issues, both for the President, for myself. I've had a conversation with Secretary Blinken, for whom it also remains a top um, issue as well. Oh, well, I, I, I certainly don't see that from Se Secretary Blinken either. Less than a week before his planned trip to China, before the Secretary's planned trip to China, the Treasury Department rolled out sanctions against Mexican drug cartels that are involved in the exportation of fentanyl and precursors that end up in the United States. The Treasury Department, in this press release, explicitly called out China's role in supplying these precursors to Mexican drug lords. However, the Secretary of State's parallel press statement omitted any mention of China. Assistant Secretary Robinson, for the record, was there any internal disagreement or debate between your bureau, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, which you lead, and the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs on whether or not to omit any mention of China in Secretary Blinken's press statement? Please give me a yes or no answer. No. No debate, no discussion. Oh, there was debate. Uh, there was discussion, but at the end of the day, uh, we agreed on uh, the statement that the Secretary... With no mention of China in it. While the Biden administration increasingly self-censors itself on China's role in America's fentanyl crisis, China's ambassador to the United States, Chen Gong, who is now the foreign minister, falsely claimed last year that China has done everything possible on our end, quote, using his words, out of goodwill to help the United States address this problem. How can the administration continue to pursue meetings with China to develop a so-called floor in the relationship when China so obviously lies about its involvement and refuses to stop the flow of fentanyl? In addition to securing and defending our open southern border, we've got to hold the CCP accountable. Does anybody have an answer about why we continue to do this? Well, I, I would say that we are uh, working aggressively to engage uh, China on this issue at a number of letter levels. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the relationship with China is, is uh, complicated. Uh, we have another, a number of issues uh, to discuss with them. Uh, and there is no doubt... Well, I will interrupt you because the number one issue we've just established, a top priority for this administration, is dealing with the poisoning of our kids. Absolutely. Yet we're not going to call them out. We're not going to mention it. That seems to be the priority. Treasury will, we, but the State we, Department will not. We are going to work as hard as we can to engage with uh, the PRC uh, multilaterally and bilaterally, if possible, to address this issue. If the State Department and the White House will not call out this problem, we will never address it. We will never that, address it. Senator, I have called them out publicly after uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit when they stopped cooperation. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to pressure them, including using sanction authority. I encourage you to do that, but I encourage you to get the Commander-in-Chief to call it out. And I encourage our top diplomat to call it out, too. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter all these documents for the record. Without objection. Thank you. Senator Sheen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. 
as, um, and thank you to our witnesses for your testimony this morning. As you can tell, this is an issue that is very personal for everyone on this committee because we see, Administrator Milgram, you talked about the faces of those killed by fentanyl. We see that in our home states um, every day. In New Hampshire's largest city of Manchester since the beginning of February, we have 10 overdose deaths from fentanyl. Um, and what we, what we are seeing now is an increasing number of cases um, related to xylazine, which is an animal tranquilizer that um, is being cut into drugs, including fentanyl. And unlike um, opioids, there is no um, reverse agent like Narcan to reverse those overdoses. So can you tell me, Administrator Milgram, does the DEA have a position on scheduling um, drugs like xylazine that are used for legitimate medical purposes but that are being um, used illicitly? Um, and what is your position on that? Senator, thank you so much for that question. We are tracking xylazine across the United States, and there is no question that it is an increasing threat. We are seeing it cut into fentanyl powder in almost every state in the country at this moment in time. And what we see is that fentanyl, which is the deadliest drug we've ever seen in the United States, it's now being made deadlier by xylazine being combined with it. We asked HHS about 15 months ago to begin the process of scheduling xylazine. I would defer to them on the timing of, of that scheduling, but what I can tell you is we are looking. Did you, excuse me, we're yes. interrupting. 18 months ago, did you 15, say? 15 months ago, we sent a request to HHS to schedule. We then, last fall, sent a follow up request with additional information of what we were seeing. At this moment, my belief is that we have to do everything we can internally at DEA to stop this threat from happening. And my commitment to you is we'll do everything we can to stop it. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would argue that this committee may want to take a position on that um, with the FDA and HHS to schedule this when it's being used illicitly. Um, I want to go back to Senator Rich's and others' comment about social media because that, to me, is the most insidious aspect of what we're seeing right now um, because social media platforms, Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, they're all being used to market and sell pills that are laced with fentanyl. Right now, uh, Senator Marshall and I have a piece of legislation named after a young man from Kansas who, um, much like Senator Ricketts' um, housewife, used, um, bought a fake prescription online on Snapchat. It was per he thought it was Percocet. He took a half a pill and he died. And I think we've got to do more to force our social media companies to be responsible. So can I ask each of you what you're doing? And I appreciate, um, Secretary Robinson, that this is not necessarily your area of responsibility. But it seems to me, much as we're talking about, we've got how we have to engage globally, um, that we also have to engage all of the ways in which um, people are getting access to fentanyl and illicit drugs. So what are each of you doing to engage the social media companies? And, and what should we be doing as Congress to shut down these platforms that are being used to sell drugs? Start, Senator, thank you. Uh, clearly, th there's a lot more that social media platforms can do. The President Biden called them out for big tech in the State of the Union last Tuesday. We're, um, Looking forward to working with you, Congress, to figure out what those solutions are. But it's very clear when um, illegal activity happens on those platforms, uh, that cannot be tolerated any longer. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to working with you on that. Administrator. Thank you, Senator. Um, we have told the social media companies that American lives are being lost because of what is happening on their platforms. And we have asked them to do more. We have not seen them doing more. So I would welcome the opportunity, DEA would welcome the opportunity to work with this committee on, and others on the Hill to, to get to what I think are the two core goals. One is accountability. 
Right now, we are not seeing sufficient accountability for the lives being lost. The second is full transparency. As I sit here today, Senator, I cannot tell you how the algorithms operate on mm -hmm. any of these social media platforms. I can't explain the algorithms that are connecting the traffickers, the cartels with potential buyers. I can't tell you the algorithms that those companies are using to purportedly remove illegal content. What I can tell you, and I also can't tell you how many people they have working for their social media companies that are actively engaged on these issues. What I can tell you is that on a regular basis, we are on these social media websites, platforms, and we are seeing drug marketing and drug sales for these fake prescription pills, fake Oxys, fake Adderall, fake Percocet that have been up for months, for months. And so we know enough is not being, like whatever the social media companies are doing, it is nowhere near enough to save lives. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary Robinson. Senator, thank you so much for that question. I would just add that uh, uh, we understand the social media uh, platforms play a role, but it's e-commerce across the, the board. It's uh, freight forwarders uh, across the board. It's chemical producers, uh, both globally and uh, uh, internally across the board. The private sector across the board has a responsibility um, and I look forward to working with my colleagues, uh, both here at the table and uh, within the interagency, in, uh, in getting at that responsibility, engaging um, uh, with the private sector on this issue. Well, I certainly agree with you, it's broader, but my grandchildren aren't on those commercial websites um, on a daily basis. They are on the social media sites. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope we could get Americans to understand, don't buy your pills on social media as a general proposition. We should be doing an education campaign to that effect uh, because if that's where you revert to, then the integrity of the product it can never be guaranteed at the end of the day. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here this morning to talk about such an important issue that's impacting so many Americans around this country. I know we all recognize the 107,000 plus deaths because of overdoses and how tragic it is. And so often we talk about the numbers without really appreciating the personal impact that it's having on families throughout this country. And devastation from West Virginia to South Carolina. And I just think we have to do more to close our southern border to stop fentanyl from coming across the border and killing American lives in such a way that it's been devastating to families. And, uh, a friend of mine, just Saturday before last, buried his son, 27-year-old son, because of fentanyl. And too often we see these issues as large numbers, 107,000 Americans. We think about the thousands in South Carolina, but we, we, we don't think about the actual tragedy it seems like to the average family that loses a loved one. There's no family in this nation that is disconnected from the issue of fentanyl. And we should do more, we can do more, and I believe it starts with our southern border. If we close our southern border, stop fentanyl from coming across, we could end the devastation and the tragedy that's being experienced by so many American families. And I just wanna read what Alan Chow, who is the former dean of the business school at the College of Charleston in, in my hometown, a longtime friend of mine, that what he said about his son at his son's funeral. To my loving son, Alan, the day you were born was the day I gained a son. You were by far the most beautiful baby out of everyone. You looked at me and gave me a big smile. I knew that my life was complete with you as my child. We named you Alan after me, of course, because you stole my heart with such a loving force. As the years went by and you grew to play sports, in my eyes, you were the best on all fields and all courts. Always, I was always so proud of you as my son that no matter the score, we always knew that we won. The years kept on passing. Our family went separate ways, but you and I never did. We were together to stay. You eventually went to college, even got your degree. I was such a proud father, as proud as could be. Well, we went through hard times and good times over the years, often ending up with a hug and a whole lot of tears. Now for the hard part, 
to even speak breaks my heart. A few days ago, I learned the worst news I could imagine. You left me too soon and went on to heaven. I want you to know, son, that I will join you someday. I can't wait to see you. We'll hold hands and we'll pray. But for now, I'll have a broken heart that will never, ever mend. So I'll just live my life until I see you again. I love you, Alan. Too many of these stories, of these words, are being spoken at too many funerals. Completely avoidable. Dr. Gupta, what are we gonna do to close our southern border so that we can stop hearing fathers bury their sons, mothers burying their kids? I think it's very much avoidable. Senator Scott, thank you for those beautiful words. And obviously, um, every tragedy, every single tragedy, worth bearing talking about, it's important. Um, I'm a father of two 25-year-olds, um, boys, and I know, talk to them every day because of that. I think when, uh, th this is exactly how I approach the job, is to figure out where all we can do and what we can do. This is reason that we're pushing for a global commercial disruption concept to deny profits, to make sure that we take, take data, take evidence where it exists and act on it. Act on it, not worrying about what's in the past. Um, this is why, as majority of that, the, the drugs come through the ports of entry. There is technology that we can adopt and magnify resources, infrastructure that could put, that will help us detect as much fentanyl as possible we can, um, and, and this is exactly what the president's calling out for, making sure that we have those scanners, making have the technology. Mr. Chairman, with my last seconds left, I would just say that we have to do more, and technology is one way of doing more, but the truth of the matter is until we close our border, this issue continues without the physical impediments to be in the place where we can't have technology, where we can't have people. We need to actually do everything in our power to change the course of American history. I think we can do that. We should take it as a bipartisan challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. As I turn to Senator Kane, let me just, uh, for the record, I asked questions at the beginning of this hearing, and I have my own answers uh, based upon information. And I'd like to include it in the record, because I think it creates context for our discussion. Um, according to the Bipartisan Commission on Combating Synthetic Opioid Trafficking, Mexican cartels traffic illicit fentanyl to the United States primarily via established ports of entry at the southwestern border. And according to CBP data, in fiscal year 22, roughly 85% of all fentanyl seizures occurring at the southwestern border of the United States occurred at ports of entry through tractor trailer trucks and passenger vehicles. So when we talk about doing more, making sure that those ports of entries have the technology that can be invasive so that 85% of all of that fentanyl can be stopped is a huge reality. But uh, uh, I think it's important to know where the process of how the entry of the fentanyl into the United States is taking place so that we can ultimately combat it. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd just like to pick up on that and on Senator Scott's request, hey, can't we find a bipartisan path forward? We should be able to invest more ports of entry to, to um, get a lot more fentanyl before it crosses the border. There's sort of a, um, a lottery situation where we can only inspect one out of every so many vehicles, and the cartels know that, and they don't mind somebody getting caught and going to prison. Um, as long as they can get a lot of other fentanyl through the ports of border. So I'm sure hoping that the president's budget that comes over here next month asks Congress to do a robust investment in border security at ports of entry because CBP is pioneering technologies that have shown that they can work, but we just have to do it with all vehicles and do it in a prompt way so that we can pick up more. I want to thank the CBP agents. When you look at the amount that's been interdicted either at the border by CBP agents or by the Haida task forces internally. You want to thank those folks, but you also want to say, as bad as this is, hundreds of thousands more pounds of these 
drugs had they not been interdicted in that way by these public servants, how much worse it would be. The other bit of news, Dr. Gupta, that I was pleased to read in your testimony, and you mentioned it in your uh, verbal testimony too, was that just as before COVID, we were seeing overdose deaths coming down, and then during COVID for a variety of reasons, including fentanyl, but other reasons as well, the isolation of COVID, we saw overdose deaths go back up. You now have indicated that at least preliminary data suggests that for the last five months, they've been coming down again. It's too soon to call it a trend, but we wanna watch it and learn from it. Um, in Virginia, we'll, we'll expect about 2,500 fentanyl deaths this year, and Senator Scott, you know, what, what he read from his friend, I mean, this is, these, there are these funerals happening multiple, multiple times a day. And I'm particularly, I guess I wanna ask you, Dr. Milgram, or, um, Secretary Milgram, about kids. Um, the ki kids get drugs and often accidentally overdose because they think they're getting an Adderall or they think they're getting something else and it's cut with fentanyl. And so you mentioned in your testimony the One Pill Can Kill campaign. Tell us more about that campaign and, you know, are you seeing it as a success? Because clearly if we can't make people aware of the danger and curb demand that way, there will always be a supplier who will be creative, but what can we do on the demand side and one pill can kill is designed to address that. Thank you, thank you so much, Senator, for that question. At, at this moment in time, we believe that public awareness is one of the most vital things that we can do. We have a, a very hardened senior agent in charge in the United States who said to me not too long ago that if he had an hour of time right now, and he had to choose between putting handcuffs on someone or doing public awareness, right now he would do public awareness because still too many Americans do not understand the dangers. So we launched the One Pill Can, Can Kill campaign in the fall of 2021, and we've done enforcement actions as well, and we've seized pills across the United States in all 50 states to highlight this work. We also give that campaign to anyone and everyone who wants it. We have intentionally not branded it from DEA or DOJ. And so we have a university in the Midwest that just launched it. We have a police department in Florida that has taken it on. And we have countless families and, and parents who've lost their children who have taken the One Pill King campaign, Can Kill campaign and all of the materials we have. We've also started meeting with families who've lost loved ones, and last year for the first time, we did nationwide family summits on drug poisoning deaths. Again, trying to understand from the families what information would be vital for them to have known and to have had to make sure that their loved ones knew of the threat. And I believe, Senator, as I sit here, that the cartels are acting with deliberate, calculated treachery. They make these pills, buying pill presses and dyes and dye molds, mostly from China as well, that look identical to the real pharmaceutical medicines. Please. Let me ask you sort of a data question. Um, in the data about overdose deaths, do we closely track those that are accidental? Someone thought they were taking something else and it turned out that it was laced with fentanyl? Because obviously any death to an overdose is a, is a tragedy, but the strategy Yep. for dealing with the accidentals is a little bit different than the strategy for dealing with people who might have, you know, become a, a patient taking prescribed opioids and then they go into fentanyl. So do we track that data? So so two pieces. One is if you listen to the language I use today, I don't I don't use the term overdose anymore. And that's because of the time I've spent with the families mm -hmm. who've lost mm -hmm. loved ones. So many Americans are dying right now and they're dying because fentanyl is cut into other drugs that they're taking right. or it is in a fake prescription pill. So, so overdose suggests you you were you know you were taking something and maybe you took too much but actually it's accidental they weren't intending to take fentanyl or an opioid at all. And we think that using the term excuse me that using the term drug poisoning whatever is happening the fentanyl is actually poisoning people's bodies. And so we we prefer to talk about it now as drug poisoning. I, I'm over time but do do you track that data and if so I'm going to ask that follow up. I'll ask that for the record. I want to yield back to the chair. Yes. Sir. Thanks. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Milgram, would you agree that the vast majority of the heroin, the methamphetamine, and fentanyl we see in American communities comes from Mexico? 
Senator, I would say that the vast majority of fentanyl and meth is coming from the, the two cartels, Jalisco and Sinaloa from Mexico. They also transport heroin and, and cocaine in, um, but I would, I would not say the vast majority of heroin and cocaine. Okay. I would say the vast majority of fentanyl and meth. Would you also agree that the brave men and women working along the southern border and at our port, ports of entry, our Border Patrol and CBP officers, serve a critical role in interdicting drugs before they hit our streets? Senator, as I, as I, um, as I say often, the, the way at DEA, we're, we are the, single, the only single mission federal law enforcement agency committed to narcotics. And, and to stopping the global supply chain. We play offense, and so we're, tra we're tracking these cartels worldwide so, and across So is our that a yes, we've got limited time? DHS's responsibility is, is to, to maintain the southern border and the ports of entry. Our investigations do tell us that the vast majority of fentanyl is coming in the ports of entry, two particularly in California and two in Arizona. So is that a yes, that you would agree that CBP officers, both on the southern border and the ports of entry, play a critical role in interdicting drugs? Yes, Senator. I believe it's, it's a DHS responsibility, and it's a critical one. So if, if we decided to cut the number of Border Patrol agents dramatically, let's say in half, would you agree that would hurt our efforts to stop illegal drugs? Senator, I would, I would defer some of this to the Department of Homeland Security and Secretary Mayorkas. You're not um, willing to answer that question? But here's, here's what I would say about this. We believe that DHS plays vital defense. Okay, okay, those are talking points. Would cutting the number of CBP agents in half hurt our ability to stop drugs, yes or no? Senator, I believe it would. Okay. That's effectively what's happened under the Biden administration. Because right now today, more than half of the, of the CBP agents are engaged in housekeeping and chauffeurs and babysitting of the 5.5 million illegal aliens who have crossed the border. They're not on the border. They're not at the ports of entry. They are instead processing the highest rate of illegal immigration in history. Now, Democrat members of Congress have the remarkable claim that the open borders under Joe Biden has no impact on the record fentanyl and drugs that are flooding across our borders. Between October 2021 and September 2022, one CBP source estimated there were 364,000 gotaways, people that ran away at the southern border. Another Border Patrol officials put the number of gotaways at 1.2 million. Gotaways can vary from terrorists on the terror watch list. In fiscal year 20, 2022, 98 people on the terror watch list were encountered at the southern border that we know of or they can be drug dealers carrying drugs. Is that correct? Senator, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer questions on the border and the ports of entry to the Department of Homeland Security. So the DEA has no view on whether drug dealers crossing the border carry drugs? Senator, as I said from our investigations, what we see is that the majority of fentanyl I didn't ask the majority. The I, I, I said drug dealers and gotaways are carrying drugs, many of them. Senator, what we see is mostly interdict what we, what we see is mostly tractor trailers and personal vehicles. All right, so you're sticking fentanyl. to the talking points closely and congratulations. It's the Democrat talking points that the open borders don't matter with 328,000 or 1.2 uh, million gotaways don't matter. We had 100,000 people die last year of drug overdoses. My sister died of a drug overdose just over a decade ago. This is a crisis, but it is a man-made crisis. This administration made a conscious political decision to open the borders. And one of the results is they have turned Mexican drug cartels into multi-billionaires in 2018 the amount of money cartels made from human trafficking, according to the New York Times, was $500 million. Now, just from human trafficking, the cartels are making $13 billion a year. Again, according to the New York Times, that's a 2,600% increase. Mm -hmm. Administrator Milgram, the single best thing that happened to Mexican drug cartels in history was Joe Biden becoming president, opening the border, and making tens of billions of dollars for these vicious criminals. In your judgment, is, a, is it a good thing that these cartels now have tens of billions of dollars from human trafficking and drug trafficking? Senator Cruz, 
I really appreciate the opportunity to answer your question. And as I have said clearly and will continue to say, there are two cartels in Mexico, the Sinaloa and Jalisco cartel, that are responsible for the devastation that we are seeing on the streets of our country. It is our top operational Would priority you to defeat those two cartels and to stop the fentanyl and methamphetamine that Would is flooding Would you answer the question I asked? Is it a good thing for them to have tens of billions of dollars now that they didn't have? Senator, we are doing everything we can. Okay, you're refusing to answer the question. And this shouldn't be a hard question. Every to amount of money, if I, if I, please, if, if I could please. finish. Um, it, I, I very much understand your point. We believe that the cartels are making billions of dollars on illicit is that good fentanyl. Or bad? It is a terrible thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all. And uh, uh, Mr. Robinson, the efforts have been talked about about trying to stem the precursors from China to Mexico. And everyone I know has raised, is there any other insights that you can share that you haven't shared already the committee about our efforts to stop this? China did respond when we pushed them hard on the direct sending of uh, fentanyl into the United States. How do we now accomplish shutting them down on the precursors? Well, uh, as, I said, er, um, as, I, as I said earlier, we are going to continue to try to engage uh, with the PRC on this issue. But the fact is, because this is a global uh, uh, problem, other countries are engaging the uh, PRC on this issue. Uh, we have had uh, positive engagements with, uh, with India, with Pakistan, with uh, uh, Mexico, uh, with Canada. All of them have also uh, pushed uh, the PRC to do more uh, to, to monitor the precursors leaving uh, uh, China. Okay, I'm just, thank you very much. And, and I know you're pushing on this. It's a piece that seems so critical if we're going to stop the, the, the flow if, or reduce it greatly. Uh, and uh, I, th I think we've already heard some comments about some other countries are starting to send precursors as well. So it's, it's a, a world uh, challenge, but that's the biggest piece at the moment. Um, I'll tell you, every I've had uh, now 19 town halls uh, this year in Oregon, 19 of the 36 counties. I do a town hall in every county. This issue comes up everywhere. There are parents in every county who have lost their brothers, their sisters, their spouses, their children uh, to uh, the contamination uh, from fentanyl. And uh, that's just a, a, just a horrific uh, impact uh, on America. And I know that all of you are doing the, the, the best you can. And, and I think the whole bipartisan effort here is to say, yes, keep going. We support you. How can we help you more? I, Administrator Milgram, at the board, I had statistics from the U.S. Sentencing Commission, and I just wanted to see if they fit what you have from the DEA. And they say that the, from 2016 to 2021, the five-year average was that 90% of the, the fentanyl uh, seized was from border crossings uh, and uh, interior vehicle checkpoints. Does that fit your understanding? Senator, we, we at DEA, we don't have the specific information that CBP or Border Patrol would have. So I, I could, we could ask the Department of Homeland Security and get back to you. Okay. Because I, th I think underst understanding the dynamics, right, of where the drugs are coming, and we've heard reference to the fact, uh, uh, Dr. Gupta, you were referring to the fact that the cartels want to move it fast in, in what, in that the fast and most efficient way seems to be through border crossings. And that statistic seems to, seems to back that up. But the other thing that I found very surprising was according to the same stats from the Sentencing Commission, that 91% of those seizures at the border are from US citizens. And so I also just wanted to ask if you're familiar with that, that stat and if you consider it accurate. Senator, uh, again, DEA is not responsible for the border or the border patrol, but I'm no, happy I to No, I sure ask. understand that, yes. but in drug enforcement, you want to understand the issue, and these are basic fundamental facts about the drug flow, so... What we see, Senator, we see, um, we see basically, we see Americans and we see Mexicans and we see people um, 
we interdict, we interdict many, we're not responsible for the border. So when we're doing investigations, we're generally doing them in the United States. And yes, we are making seizures okay. of Americans as well as Mexican Dr. Nationals. Gupta, that 90%, that, that is, is, that, is that accurate that most of the drug seizures are actually from U.S. citizens crossing? Uh, Senator, I, kind of, I cannot watch to the exact number, but the fact is that there's a lot of people that cross the border every day just as a matter of work, going to work, going to, and those people wittingly or unwittingly often end up. And that's why, but there's still ports of entry that they're entering through. Okay, I'm, I'm surprised that given our effort to understand the challenge that neither of you kind of have the firm grip on the dynamics at the border. So I just want to encourage you to expand your horizon to understanding those, those pieces because they're such an important part of the conversation. Uh, I wanted to turn to the social media uh, challenge. And um, uh, so is it basically that uh, our youth are finding contacts through social media, and then those contacts have a supply chain where they hand deliver to the door? Or how does that work? Uh, we, we see a number of different things on social media, Senator, in our work. One of the things we see are, for example, the cartels recruiting couriers or others to sell narcotics in the United States. We also see many instances that are exactly as you describe, where you have someone who's on social media and within three or four clicks will connect with someone selling. Often what we see are fake pills. They're meant to look exactly like they were oxycodone, but they're fentanyl and filler. And that the, those pills are then delivered to their home or their office or their front door um, by someone that they don't know within, you know, often minutes or hours. Thank you. My time's up. I really appreciate you all doing everything you can to tackle this in incredibly horrific uh, challenge decimating uh, America's families. Senator Young. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I thank our witnesses for being here today. Um, this is an issue that is important to thousands of, of my constituents. Right now, 85% of all drug deaths uh, in, in the state of Indiana are, are uh, as a result of fentanyl. And uh, I'm deeply concerned about the gaps along our southern border. A number of my colleagues have asked about those. I know that invokes the responsibility of, of Mexico, uh, where uh, the cartels uh, have a, a significant presence. Um, but it's China that's one of the top producers of uh, these uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients that uh, go into the production of fentanyl. Of course, those, are, those inputs are, um, are, exist for, for licit purposes, but are diverted criminally for illicit purposes of, of producing uh, fentanyl. Um, <clears throat> you have stated clearly, Administrator Milgram, that your top priority is dealing with the Sinaloa and, and Jalisco uh, cartels in Mexico. Given the role of, of the People's Republic of China in terms of production of, of these raw materials, uh, that seems to be a really important line of effort as well. You did mention this in your opening statement. Is it your agency's um, assessment that uh, we're going to be able to stop the cartels from getting these uh, precursor chemicals from uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, when I talk about DEA's network-wide approach, I am including the facilitators in China, whether it's Chinese chemical companies or Chinese nationals, chemical brokers, or illicit finance people operating in China, the US, or Mexico. So just, just to make sure that I'm, I'm accurately explaining, our top operational goal is to defeat the two cartels and their criminal networks. And those networks are not just the command They extend control. into China. Exactly. Right. And, and, and those partnerships, we, uh, DEA investigation was just unsealed last week. It is a Chinese national, Carlos Algredo, who was a precursor chemical broker operating from Mexico. Yeah. He's alleged to have basically taken precursor chemicals from China and India into Mexico so that the Jalisco cartel okay. could make okay. them. Okay. Well, I have limited time, but I, I thought it was really important that uh, Dr. Gupta mentioned that China it has been unwilling to engage with us on this topic. 
So, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese government, uh, they're, they're part of the network. Uh, if they're going to allow this to uh, happen uh, w without intervention. Um, the ranking member mentioned that uh, fentanyl didn't even come up during the president's conversation with Xi Jinping. I think that's a, a, a notable failure to bring up something that's a top priority of my constituent constituents. Uh, the president's State of the Union address, he mentioned fentanyl commendably, uh, but failed to call out China's role in production of fentanyl. We're clearly, clearly facing a, a lot of challenges vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Chinese Communist Party. I, I, I acknowledge that. What actions, diplomatic or otherwise, have we taken against uh, China for their failure to meaningfully engage? Thank you, uh, Senator, for, yes. for that question. Um, number one, we do continue to uh, engage or try to engage uh, with the PRC on various levels. Uh, we are also talking to other countries to see if they can engage uh, with China uh, on a number of levels. We have identified, uh, as uh, Administrative Milgram uh, has noted, we have identified uh, um, businesses uh, in China that um, that we know are working with the, the coming Pentels. to the end of, but but the Chinese government has not engaged. I know we've tried to engage. You deserve credit for that. What what has been the consequences to the Chinese government for their failure to engage with us uh, about the shipment of of precursor fentanyl producing agents um, into Mexico that end up in Indiana and and kill. 85% of, of people who die of drug deaths. Well, as, as I was going to say, uh, we we will use every uh, uh, tool in our toolbox, including rewards programs, the narcotics rewards programs and the, the transnational uh, organized crime rewards programs to go after those entities in China that are moving uh, uh, these chemicals. You know, the fact is uh, China wants to be on the world stage. And in order to do that, because this is a global problem, other countries are also going to push them uh, to do the right thing on this issue. You will use. That's that's prospect. No, we are using. You, you are using. We are using. Okay. Yes. And 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 what leverage have we brought to bear against the Chinese government themselves to shape their future uh, risk calculus and, and decision making framework so that they can cooperate with us uh, to prevent these shipments in the first place? We're going to continue to push for engagement. Uh, we we have worked with them uh, just last year uh, at, in a multilateral forum uh, to schedule three uh, precursor chemicals. Um, we will continue to 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 do what it takes uh, to uh, to bring uh, bring China back to the table. And should we expect President Biden to uh, bring this issue? to the attention of and his concerns uh, directly to Xi Jinping. There should be no doubt that this is a priority, a topic uh, of concern for this president, for the secretary of state uh, um, uh, to get at both directly with the PRC and uh, in, a, in, a, in a global effort, bringing together other countries to get at this issue as well. Thank you, sir. I'm going to stay on top of this. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank all of you for your testimony here today and for your service. And um, as you've heard, and I'm sure you know, everybody on this dais has uh, met a family that's lost a loved one uh, to opioids. Probably the same is true for all of you as well. Uh, in, in Maryland, for the most recent uh, 12 months uh, of reporting uh, that's available, uh, we had 2,487 2, fatal overdoses, uh, and fentanyl was involved in uh, over 80% of those. So that's the, those are the numbers in Maryland. Behind those numbers, obviously, is a family that's lost a loved one, uh, and that is magnified throughout the country. So I, I would like to follow up on some of the questions my colleagues have asked. We've had a lot of questions today. Um, and Director Gupta, I, I, I think it's important that you get back to the committee on this issue uh, of where most of the fentanyl is crossing the border of the United States and how. Because uh, the, the figures we've seen from, from Customs and Border Patrol indicate that 90%, as Senator Merkley indicated, 
uh, is coming um, over legal crossing points and interior vehicle checkpoints. I, you, you can't confirm that today? Is that, is that your testimony? No, what I can confirm, uh, Senator Van Hollen, is that we know that overwhelming majority and 90%, uh, not individual carriers, but overall through the ports of entry is what it is coming. Right, in I terms of the that. volume, the volume of fentanyl, over 90% is coming through ports of entry. Correct. Right. So, I mean, I think that's important because we've had a, we, we have an important discussion on immigration and immigration reform, uh, but fentanyl comes in very potent small quantities, potentially, right? I mean, a very little bit can, can kill you. So, it, it, what, it, what it indicates to me is we need to do even more at our ports of entry to try to detect and intercept uh, fentanyl, and we have been working to provide additional resources uh, to do exactly that. Uh, now, to my knowledge, we don't have a similar problem with fentanyl crossing our northern border. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Which gets to the question of, of why. We've heard about China's involvement with the precursors, and we absolutely need to um, insist that they engage in that conversation with us. But it also indicates that uh, the, drug, the drug cartels in Mexico um, are out of control, and it would suggest, um, uh, as you said, uh, Administrator Milgram, that, uh, that not enough is being done by the government of Mexico to crack down on these cartels, and that in the past, when there's been a will to do it, we've seen results. Is that, I understand that was something you stated earlier. Is that right? Yes, Senator. We believe that Mexico was very effective at taking down the Zetas cartel in between 2012 and 2015, and that they absolutely have the capability um, and would welcome working with them to take down these two cartels. So when you raise this with them and you point to their earlier success and determination to take down cartels and point out that that's not happening now, what is their response? When we, when we work with, and I, and I would defer a little bit on this I would, to- so Secretary Robinson, maybe Secretary. you want to, yeah. Senator, I, I, what I would say is, uh, I think the, the Mexican government is very aware of the um, uh, mal-influence of the cartels uh, in Mexico. Um, they, they have resource issues. Um, but but the Lopez Obrador government has uh, made some decisions uh, on uh, on law enforcement that have engaged uh, the military at ports of entry. Um, there are other parts of the Mexican government that can definitely do more, uh, and we will, working with our uh, ambassador and our our team in in Mexico City, push them to do more. All right, well, I think, um, again, if you look at their past success compared to what's happening now, it, it does indicate to me anyway that um, if they're determined to do it, they can do a better job than they are now. Um, the last question relates to something Senator Shaheen uh, brought up regarding this um, new ingredient that's mixed into fentanyl and opioids, um, uh, xylazine, also known as Trank, I think that's the street, street name. Um, this has become a big issue in parts of Maryland and throughout the country. I, I heard what you said, um, Madam Administrator, about asking the uh, Department of Health and Human Services to, to list them. Where is, so there, there are legal uses to this, obviously, but where, where is it being diverted to the best of our knowledge? Like who, who is diverting it to these bad purposes? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I should have clarified this before with Senator uh, Sheehan. There are no lawful uses for humans. There are lawful uses for veterinarians. Yes. And it's called Trank because it is a horse tranquilizer right. and is being sold throughout the country um, as, as for, vet, for veterinarians. Um, what we're doing right now at DEA is we're looking internally at every authority that we potentially have to address this issue. Right, but just in terms of the trank, do you, have you been able to identify wh where it's being diverted? As you say, there are legal veterinarian purposes for this, but obviously it's being diverted to other uses. Do you have any guide, any leads as to who's doing that? Senator, I can't discuss investigations, um, and I apologize for that, uh, but I can tell you that we are actively working on this issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Follow up. Senator Booker. Mr. Chairman, uh, we're having a hearing on countering illicit fentanyl trafficking. A lot of my colleagues um, 
have seemed to be focusing on the real substantive challenges we have at the border. I think it was suggested earlier that we close the border, but we know that Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas said that it is unequivocally false that fentanyl is being brought to the United States by non-citizens encountered between the ports of entry who are making claims of credible fear and seeking asylum. The problem at the border is real. It spiked tremendously under the Trump administration relative to the Obama administration. But in a hearing about fentanyl, when there's nobody from Customs and Border Patrol here, to try to say that this, that folks coming to our border seeking asylum or seeking escaping challenges, to say that that is the center of the fentanyl crisis is just not true. We have a bipartisan urgency to deal with this crisis, and it's frustrating to me that in this hearing, a lot of folks want to try to levy other issues that are not central to dealing with this scourge. And so I'd like to just shift my questioning really quickly back to what I think are some of the real pressing issues at hand. And Mr. Mr. Secretary Robinson, if I may, um, the, the challenges we have are, are connected, as we've talked about, to countries around the world, and the need is clear to coordinate an effective uh, strategy. I, I know that uh, one forum where I hope that this is dealt with is the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs. And I understand the commission is expected to meet just next month. And so I'm wondering, number one, how active is the PRC, which is a source, major source of this problem? Um, how active has the PRC been on this commission, and what do you hope to see come from it? Thank you, Senator, for, for that question. In fact, the PRC is uh, active. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, just last year we were able to uh, schedule uh, internationally uh, three pre precursors, uh, three precursor chemicals, uh, and and put them under international monitoring, uh, with the uh, agreement of the PRC uh, on this issue. The CND, the the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, is active on this issue. The the UN across the board is act is active on this issue. Um, Dr. Gupta and I will be representing the United States at the CND uh, in March. Uh, precisely on this issue. And because again, I just want to reiterate for the record that folks seeking asylum or fleeing uh, uh, horrific violence, we know that the problem is really coming through ports of entry. Overwhelmingly, the fentanyl problem in the United States, that is the source, right? That's correct. And, and the role that China is playing in that is something that should be at the center of our focus in dealing with this, correct? Absolutely. All right. Um, Administrator Ye, Administrator Milgram, uh, a recent, recent Washington Post article highlighted the expansion of legalization of fentanyl test kits. Um, while these kits were historically considered paraphernalia, Republican governors, Republican governors, are and lawmakers in Alabama, Ohio, Mississippi, Texas, and elsewhere have supported and, uh, and legalized these kits uh, that can help people see if the drugs are contaminated with fentanyl, the drugs they're taking. I just really want to know what your view is of these fentanyl test kits. Senator, that um, fentanyl test kits are run from HHS. They're, they're the lead agency in addressing um, these issues. What I can tell you is we know that a number of things are being researched at HHS. Um, and the one thing that I've looked to see and just to make sure that I can understand is the use of something like a fentanyl test strip on a counterfeit fake pill and just how effective that can be to make sure um, that people understand, again, one of our core things is having public awareness and making sure people understand the threats that that's are your, out that's there. That's your one pill can kill campaign. That's our one pill can kill campaign. And but I would, uh, so I would really turn to the health experts at, at HHS that I know are looking at the test kits issue. So maybe I can get you just uh, to respond for the record. You, you said something I thought was really important that you're not even using the language overdose anymore. These are folks who think they're taking something else and then they uh, 
take one pill and, and, and face this horrific uh, uh, health reaction that could result in death. And so you can understand at least these Republican leaders around our country saying, well, let's try to figure out ways with which we can prevent that from happening and that maybe this is one way uh, that uh, people who are actually looking to save lives, perhaps this is one way to, to, to go about that. Senator, I can, I can tell you part of DEA is our regulatory division. And so we think every day about are there ways that we can save American lives through that work? And that's why we've been supportive, for example, of the MAT Act to expand treatment to all Americans who need it for medication op and for opioid use disorder. So anything that DEA can do within our authorities, we are looking at. And just with the indulgence of the chair, one last point. So here we have this horrific problem that is uh, that all of us have, have personal connection to people dying in our states. New Jersey obviously has seen this crisis. And as we go about uh, dealing with this, um, I I'm wondering uh, the, the, the normal, the, the past lessons we've learned from the so-called war on drugs and others, seeing an array of, of, of ways of approaching it, and, and maybe I can direct that to Dr. Gupta, we need to start looking at other ways to, to solve this crisis that may not have been in the playbook at all uh, in our past efforts with the, the so-called war on drugs from decades past. Um, exactly right, Senator Booker, and this is why the uh, Biden drug control strategy for the first time in the history of the United States uh, government recognizes harm reduction as an important tool that includes naloxone, includes testing strips for fentanyl, as well as student service programs, in addition to expanding treatment, recovery, and prevention. Uh, because to add those pieces is the second part of the same coin. We need to be looking at it as one coin where there's a challenge with supply and aspects, but also demand reduction is very critical because we've got 9 million Americans that are suffering from opioid use disorder today, in addition to those so, who so are just dying. Just simple. Yeah. Law enforcement is necessary but not sufficient to solving this crisis in the United States of America, correct? Absolutely correct. Thank you, sir. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Booker. Uh, well, we're going to close this hearing. You know, I called this hearing because this is a national urgent issue, and there are foreign policy dimensions to it. And I called it in the spirit that both Democrats and Republicans uh, need to join together in order to meet this challenge, collectively, as the United States of America. It's disheartening that even though uh, the fentanyl overdose uh, in terms of a skyrocketing and spike began under the president, uh, previous president's watch, President Trump, and continues to be a challenge today, that there are those who want to characterize it in a certain way. When DEA uh, seizes over 50 million fentanyl lace fake prescription pills and more than 10,000 pounds of fentanyl power in 2022, we know those aren't individuals carrying that. That's why the ports of entry, that's why CBP says the points of entry, 85%, all coming through tractor trailers and vans. So if we want to meet part of the challenge here, let's focus on where the real challenge really is. It's at ports of entry. And what we do at ports of entry that has sophisticated scanning equipment to stop it there as you fight the two cartels uh, globally. Uh, that's how we're going to do that. And then also, we have to challenge China and Mexico. I'm not satisfied in either of the two contexts that we are doing what we need to do. And lastly, I I'm very well considering filing legislation that stops the, the sale of uh, any form of prescription drug on social media because you don't know whether it's a real prescription drug or not. Uh, and that maybe can very well help us uh, realize less thefts. With the thanks of the committee for your collective testimony, this hearing will remain open to the close of business tomorrow, and this hearing is adjourned.